thank you very much. Thanks for the introduction. So yes, I come from academia. I come from mostly an HPC world, but incidentally today I'm not going to talk much about HPC. I'm very thankful to Robin and DK because they did most of my job, uh, showing HVM, showing NVLink, uh, showing collectives, and that's not at all what I'm going to be talking about. So that's great. Uh, thank you. So. The subject today is going to be deep learning and GPU. I'm pretty sure a lot of you have seen deep learning popping as applications today on all the infrastructure you're managing or working with. And I just want to show you what are the new challenges in deep learning, the way NVIDIA approaches those challenges, and what they mean in terms of large scale deployment. So, first, some kind of like vocabulary so that we're all together. GPU computing, yes, it's computing on the GPU. Uh, it sounds ridiculous, but as we've seen before, the GPU has to be attached to something. And that something can be a power uh, GPU, as we see, it can be a NOM, and it can be a NIX 86. The only reason I'm, I'm saying that is that used to be a constraint, and the way NVIDIA tries to make it is that it's not such a constraint for you as one might think. The way we do that is by approaching the software stack and the framework to program NVIDIA GPU. So we talked before like we had to talk before about the hardware. But now I want to approach the software stack. So the way we do it is through CUDA, which is the framework to provide the NVIDIA GPU. And the idea behind it is to have something which is as simple as C. That's the sum of the two vector uh, arrays in C. Oh, do I have a pointer? OK, doesn't matter. So you have the simple sum of two vectors in C, and you have the GPU version friendly in CUDA. It's intending to be as simple as possible and to look as similar as possible. That's one way of engagement with the GPU. What? But sometimes people say, hey, you know, it's too complicated. I don't want to go that route. So for that, with our partners, we provide like a bunch of GPU accelerated libraries so that computing can just be drop in on the GPU. If you know how to do a sort, you can just like, you know, call thrust and you'll have a way of sorting on the GPU without having to worry so much about the hardware. Now, We've seen the way we traditionally approach computing on the GPU. Uh, as far as vocabulary goes, I just want to show you what is a deep neural network. And for that, I'm going to use an example, a very basic one. So let's imagine I have a bunch of images. Like I have images of cars, buses, truck, motorcycles. And I want to be able to recognize the next vehicle I'm going to see on the road, for example. So I take a lot of images. I push them through a neural net. I'm going to train their weights from a machine learning perspective. That's going to be the training part. Then I will see a new image in the street, for example, and I will run inference. Inference is basically the prediction. I'm going to take that image, push it through the network, and hope for an answer. For example, if I see a truck, I'll get truck. This is a very different way of working than people did in the past, because it's not like a physical simulation where you know already your parameters and you just launch it once and for all. In a typical machine learning and deep learning training run, you pick a deep neural network design, you input 100 million training images spanning something like a thousand categories, and it's one week of computation. But you're not sure you've chosen the right parameters at the beginning. So you're going to do that again and again until you reach the accuracy you are aiming for. And the problem is it's one week of computation, by default, and you might need to do that hmm, 20 times. But you don't have those six months. So that's why people resorted to GPUs. So this is a classical example from 2012. That's the Google Brain Data Center that did run a deep learning training tax like that. At the time, it costed like $5 million, was 600 kilowatts, contained like a 1,000 CPU servers. And it was a great breakthrough. People could train a deep neural net for real on real images once. The next year, uh, at the Stanford AI lab, they reproduced the exact same experiment on three GPU accelerated servers, uh, having like four kilowatts only and so the three um, thousand dollars only. So Brian is talking tomorrow. I'm pretty sure he's going to show, showcase uh, some of that technology, but that's basically where GPU entered the game. And what happens in modern AI right now is like if you look at the ImageNet challenge here, which is basically the standard for image recognition in the computer vision community, uh, in blue you have the traditional CV techniques 
that are non-deep learning, and in red you have the deep learning techniques. Until 2013, people still tried with CV, now they don't even try anymore. We reach human accuracy through the neural network, and this was only made possible because we had a good marriage of data, GPU providing the power, and making it available to the people, and the algorithms were here too. So now, Deep learning is everywhere. You might have seen it in the medical sector. I'm pretty sure you've heard about AlphaGo. Um, so this is the way we beat some of the things we saw were impossible before. The way NVIDIA approached that is by supporting people that work on frameworks for deep learning to be able to leverage different types of application. For that reason, NVIDIA CUDA is the accelerated completing platform of several uh, company-based frameworks, but also academic frameworks. Among the most famous is Ca our Cafe, Tor, Shiano, TensorFlow, and they all run on NVIDIA platform right now. How do they do that? So to make sure frameworks can leverage the GPU without having to have a specific code implementation, we provide a library to accelerate deep learning uh, operations. So. This is just to show that our involvement is not only on hardware. This, uh, this was like two years ago on K40. We just added the library to accelerate the convolution. And with the new architecture and the new version of the library, in two years, we went five times faster. That week I talked about before has now been reduced to five to six hours. Right? Uh, performing, like, scientifically, the scientists can obtain much, much better result in like, a smaller amount of time. Multi-GPU. So I'm very glad to the previous talk uh, because we approached collective. We've also been involved into working multi-GPU communication through the Nickel library. It's a collective library, which is topology aware. So right now, I said you have to attach the GPU to something, but if you have two CPUs, you have a lot of ways to attach those GPUs. You can daisy chain them, you can put four and four, you can attach it in a lot of different variety. Depending on what you're going to do, the PCI Express is going to be your limit and might have a big impact on how well your application will be performing. To try to make that transparent to the user, we developed that collective library and we tried to make it again as simple as C and as simple as MPI, uh, exactly like what we've shown before. Now, We've seen the software stack, so we're providing, we're trying to provide everything from the CUDA programming level up to the multi-GPU communication level. In terms of platform, how does this translate? So again, here on the left, I have my data scientist, the person we were trying to train the images before. This person's going to push this million of images, so this person's going to prototype on a workstation he or she may have on his desk. And then it's going to push to a large data center, which is my weird drawing with solver network dashboard here and we're going to build a model. But what's super nice about deep learning is you can take that model, push it into a car or a drone, and run inference or some kind of deep learning task with it. I said that I would recognize a truck in the street, but that's going to be my car computer doing that in the street. It's not going to be sending a message to the data center. The car computer itself can recognize that. Raise an exception. Imagine I was expecting a dog to cross, but inside I saw a deer. Maybe my system doesn't know what a deer is because I'm a different country or something. So then I can push back the data through the cloud, push back to the data, retrain, and do that all over again. So I have that feedback loop, which is only made possible by the fact that the hardware architecture is the same, or compatible, and that the software stack is the same. That model deployment here is just basically pushing a model file and pressing a button. So how do we do that? Uh, we have several software projects for that. So we have Digits, which is a GUI for prototyping. We have CUDNN, which is a deep learning library. We have QSPOS, which is a sparse matrix operation library. QBLAS, which is dependent of the live library you're all familiar with, and Nickel. For development, on the workstation, you have the Titanix, you have the DevBox. For large-scale deployment, we offer the same type of infrastructure with a deep learning SDK, a, deep, a GPU REST engine, an accelerated video, a compute engine, and the GPU support in Mesos, for example. This is the embedded part. Uh, it could be on a car, but it could also be on a drone. That's the intelligence machine version. It's basically inside, it's the next one. It's the same actual architecture as we've seen before in the M40 that goes in the data center. So, 
How do we use the GPU for deep learning? I see my time is running out, so I'm going to go faster. This is digits. That's the GUI uh, I've been talking about in the past. Now we also have a level where people can interact with the GPU only with a GUI, not having to worry about the libraries, not having to worry about the coding. And for the first time, we also made that into an appliance. So this is a workstation appliance we develop to both showcase the hardware, but also the software stack. And the only constraint we had when building the appliance is it has to be able to fit on a desk and being plugged into a wall, meaning our only constraint was the 1600 power watt power supply and the fact that you need to be able to sit next to it without having a lot of noise or heat. So what happens for the data center? You might have seen this machine. Uh, you start 10 minutes late. Uh, so I still have 10 minutes, sorry, because I see the, the red thing blinking, sorry, thank you. Oh, so that's good, so I'm going to start early so that people can go to lunch early, I'm sorry about that. Uh, so for the data center, what happens? So you might have seen this machine, uh, especially it's an open compute machine whose design has been released already. This is the Facebook Big Sur AGPU server. Uh, has, any, has any of you seen that machine or read a bit about that machine? Do you know what that machine has special? I have some time, so, so I, can, I can try to bug you on what you like about this machine and what you dislike. Because I have my own opinion that I don't want to. <laughs> so what is so special about the machine? Well, it uses the open compute uh, form factor, so it's wider and lets more air go through there. Like that. It's wider. Yeah. OK, it's wider. But that won't affect my GPU computing. Maybe, yeah, I can put more fans or, OK, fine. Any other, in terms of, you know, attaching PCIe and everything? Can say that again? No, it doesn't have NVLink support. <laughs> it's a pure PCIe machine. It's a pure PCIe machine, but Facebook has, designed, uh, has mentioned that they wanted AGPU on the same root complex. So that machine has AGPU on the same root complex, but it's also PCIe reconfigurable. So you can change the PCIe configuration on that machine. So that means attaching the CPU to the GPU has become important, but also application specific. And depending on your application, you might want to attach it differently. And we're reaching the stage where the collective the interconnects and everything are going to be very, very important to make sure it's transparent to user while offering the best performance. Um, with NVLink, that problem would be solved because we would have a way to attach all the GPUs together. But I'm not going to tell more on that. <laughs> so the cards that are in this machine are really specific. In part, so this is the M40. That's the Tesla accelerator for deep learning in the data center. It has a, a relatively big, pe big peak, single precision. So deep learning workloads are mostly so single precision, sometimes even half precision. And it offers uh, a very performance for it dependent on the so both on the and is the same is the equivalent. So what else can one with the that well, but this is a the lighting and it can recognize most of the sports that are featured on the video and this runs real time some sports here <laughs> so it's estimated like human accuracy for image recognition is around 5% the systems now can do much below human accuracy and interestingly, that 5% uh, limit what's set up in Stanford. So Andre Carpetti from uh, Fefe Lee's lab basically trained himself to recognize Dodge Breed and realized that by putting as much effort as he could into it, he could only reach like a 5% accuracy in recognition. And the systems right now are around 4.5. So this is for sports and TV and video. There's another example for automotive. So this is a segmentation 
uh, video. So basically what's going on here is we have a system which, which is like labeling every pixel. So we don't see that very well, but in gray it's written road and you're going to have the car in purple and I'm not sure what's the red one. But basically, in real time, this system is uh, describing the whole scene in a video. So we can completely understand why this is at the base of the autonomous cars and this IT going. However, this is only the inference part. So if you remember what I told you before, uh, you still need to train that model beforehand to make it run like that. And that training is done on a very large infrastructure. Image captioning, so I like that example because that's an example that was made at Stanford too. So, Enrico Patti, again from FIFI's lab, uh, did a system where you give an image and it's going to give you a description of what that image contains. So it's captioning the images. But it's not only giving you, oh, this is a bird, it's telling you it's a bird perched on a branch of a tree. Of a tree. So basically the explanation can get much richer to the fact that, uh, due to the fact that you train models together with images and description. That's also what we can do with it. And this is a, a very nice example that I like very much. So uh, this is exactly the kind of game I would play when I was very young. It's the uh, brick breaker. I'm going to try to go a little bit further. So this is the, you have a little panel and you have a bowl and you have to break with the bricks. And so we train a system by reinforcement learning to do that. So basically you don't tell the system anything about what the system can do. You just let the system lose. And it's like, it's the people have the analogy of it's like raising a kid. You tell your kid, you know, don't, don't use your bike with flip flops and then your kid's going to fall and have a problem with a foot or something and then yeah, next time the kid won't use flip flops. So that's exactly what's going on here. You don't tell anything to the system, the system's going to keep on losing and learning himself, uh, itself, how to, how to do that. And there is this kind of myth that the people who programmed that system were young enough that they had never played that game and they didn't know about the strategy where you could send the ball on the side once you've broken some bricks and have them break everything from the top. And after a while, we're going to see the system, after only two hours of training, the system's going to find that strategy on its own and the system's going to try breaking the bricks from the top. And obviously the system is much better at this than human after a while. <laughs> okay, I'm done. Uh, thanks for the 10 minutes more. Uh, <laughs> just a bunch of links and resources. So if you're interested in knowing more, we have a relatively extensive We also provide ends on lab where people the opportunity to try the learning on the GPU for Amazon instances. And my email is here for the information. I'll be around for the next two days. Thank you very much. <laughs>